Welcome back everyone, it's me again, Matmus. I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for joining me. Now, some of you are probably wondering who's already seen this video from my channel before. Matmus, why are you re-uploading this video and why did you remove it from your channel? Well, the reason is, basically, now that I am part of Canadian Armed Forces, I have to be very careful as to the kind of things I talk about with my own military equipment, or anyone's military equipment for that matter. You've got to remember, folks, that I am not a subject matter expert. That means that I do not know everything about armoured fighting vehicles, especially my own country's weapons and vehicles. Therefore, I have to be quite careful as to how I side my opinion. Now that I serve in the Canadian Armed Forces as a reservist, I really need to be careful as to how I portray my opinion onto certain pieces of equipment when I really don't know as much that I think that I know just from researching it from public sources. That being said, today we are going to look again at the LAV-3 vehicle and how amazing it is for Canada's service, our military, and how proud I am to say that this vehicle is alongside me if needs be in future conflicts or training situations. Now I've never really served with these vehicles, I have seen them in Suffield and training there with the British Army back in my olden days, but being as a Canadian soldier I've only really kind of clambered on them and looked at them whilst I was on DP1 training, but they are amazing bits of kit. So let's first of all talk a little bit about this vehicle's family history. Now most major armoured fighting vehicle manufacturers have facilities in a number of different countries. General Dynamic Land Systems is really no exception to that at all. And Canada actually has its own large facility in Canada known as GDLS Canada, which was previously GM Defence and was purchased by GDLS, which focuses on the production and development of wheeled vehicles for the international market and here home in Canada. The Swiss firm Moag developed a series of 4x4, 6x6 and 8x8 wheeled troop carriers for the Swiss Army commonly known as the Piranha during the 1970s. Their order books have expanded to include international purchases from many other nations and armies that include the licensed production during the 1970s of their 6x6 vehicle by GDLS Canada for the Canadian Army, who designated it the Armoured Vehicle General Purpose, aka AVGP. There were three variants of this vehicle that were built. The Grizzly, the Infantry Carrier variant, the Cougar, which had a British Scorpion tank turret equipped with a 76mm main gun, and finally, the Husky, the recovery vehicle. Re -re. GDLS Canada 8x8 vehicles are called light armoured vehicles, better known as LAVs. The LAV is not a European designation of the Piranha. Since the production of the AVGP, GDLS Canada has gone to develop the LAV 2 and LAV 3, which despite some similarities to the Swiss Piranhas, are GDLS's own designs, based on AVGP and not copies of the Swiss Piranhas. The LAV-2 8x8 was developed during the 1980s and is known as the LAV-25 along with the United States Marine Corps and it is known as the Coyote Reconnaissance Vehicle. And the Bison is the infantry carrier vehicle in Canada and the ASLAV in Australia. The LAV-3 was developed in the late 1990s for the Canadian Forces and is also in service with the New Zealand Army. It serves as both armies' principal infantry fighting vehicle. The US Army also has its own variant known as the Striker and is a lighter armoured version of this vehicle. The LAV-3 offered greater payload carrying capabilities but most importantly a higher level of protection over other LAV vehicles and non-LAV APCs in service at the time of the Canadian Army including the cute as it is M113. It was purchased to replace all the other aging troop carrying vehicles in the Canadian Army. The base vehicle offered all round protection of 7.62mm fire and with its Maxis passive protection armor module, it could withstand 12.7mm fire. The success of the series really has been its high mobility and adaptability to serve in mission roles. As you can see, this vehicle has taken nearly four road wheels off and it's still rolling in its 8x8 configuration. That is bloody impressive, folks. And something that's a game changer, obviously environments like Afghanistan where it really proved itself to do very, very well. In Canada, the LAV-3 National Procurement started in 1998 to 2006. The Canadian Army is the largest operator of LAV-3 vehicles, with 651 delivered to date. There are 313 infantry carriers, 181 command posts, 71 tow missile carriers, and 47 observation vehicles, along with the following 39 engineering variants to support those on the ground. A number of vehicles are currently going through an upgrade program. 
The Canadian Army has deployed over 100 LAV-3s to Afghanistan with its contribution being a major presence to ISAF. The war and its terrain did have a heavy toll on LAV-3s to the point that a reported 33% of the fleet were out of service at one time. Canada completed its ISAF participation in March 2014 and honestly, from my own personal perspective when it comes to seeing these vehicles operate in Afghanistan, they deserved every shining glory moment they should have because they did very very well in the terrains that they were placed in. There was a version called the LAV-UP or UP upgrade, which will extend the LAV-3 lifespan for the Canadian armies to 2035. There are other countries that utilize this vehicle as already mentioned, Colombia, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia and some others are some of the key players when it comes to this vehicle. And why not? It does so well with other countries that I think it's going to get exported to many many more in the future. Uh, in late November 2008, Canada's Department of National Defense announced its intention to combine three programs into one general set of upgrades to its armored fighting vehicle fleet. The 5 billion Canadian dollar program would include a close combat vehicle in order to perform as a tracked infantry fighting vehicle or armoured personnel carrier alongside Canada's new Leopard 2A6M. The Leopard 2A4M also was placed into service alongside these vehicles and a new tactical armoured patrol vehicle was needed to be upgraded for the LAV 3s to increase the wheeled APC fleet's capabilities. On the 21st of October 2011, General Dynamics Land Systems Canada was awarded a contract by the Canadian Department of National Defence valued at $1.6 billion to incorporate a comprehensive upgrade package into the Canadian Army's fleet of LAV-3 combat vehicles. The LAV-3 upgrade project will modernise 550 vehicles, significantly enhancing their survivability, mobility, which is the key for this vehicle, and firepower, extending this fleet's life cycle to 2035. With the original LAV-3 power plant, a 350 horsepower 7.2 litre Caterpillar 6 cylinder diesel engine was replaced by a 450 horsepower Cat C9 diesel engine. Some of the other improvements that were made on the vehicle was a larger, more efficient coolant radiator. They added an armour protection package to the running gear and also to increase with the uh, resulting weight they needed to configure it a little differently. Some of the hatches for the gunner and vehicle commanders were changed in a raised box configuration on the turret top. There was a double V-shaped armour package in the rear hull to defect blasts away from the crew compartment. There was an addition of energy absorbing seats which basically means that if an IED blows up you're going to be safe by not having the, I guess, the reverberations of the explosion going through your spinal column which was very scary to me when driving the Warriors back in the day. There was also an additional improved fire control unit, thermal, day and low light sights and data displays to accompany them. The upgrade will extend the LAV-3 lifespan to 2035 and increase the level of protection to Stanag 4569 level 4 instead of the current level 3, which basically means that a military standard or mil spec of which the vehicle must be able to resist against certain calibers or indirect fire, and this has bumped it up into the next category, which is very, very important for a vehicle that's supposed to be protecting troops inside. The first 66 upgraded LAV-3s were delivered on February 1st, 2013. The success of the upgrade program and budget pressures led to the cancellation of the close combat vehicle replacement program later that year. The Nanook remotely controlled weapon station system was developed in Canada and it's also going to be gradually introduced to this vehicle to allow it to engage targets from inside the vehicle. The LAV-3 is fitted with a two-man turret armed with a M242 Bushmaster 25mm chain gun and a coaxial 7.62mm machine gun. One more 5.56mm machine gun is positioned on top of the roof and the 25mm chain gun fires the standard NATO 25mm ammunition. It has a 2400m effective range and both gunner and commander can fire the gun. Of course this weapon system is primarily used for suppression that it is to engage other targets, being that for the most part it is just an infantry fighting vehicle and not a you know vehicle that's designed to engage targets at you know sustained rates. It's there to suppress the enemy, maybe take out a few soft skin vehicles, a couple of APCs and pull out of there quickly, not for prolonged engagements. However the 25mm cannon is more than enough to puncture through some pretty heavy uh, APCs and you know soft skin vehicles which is really all it requires to do uh, and the coax and machine gun along with the commander's machine gun is going to provide that fire support for the troops on the ground if going through you know uh, close in environments like urban environments and of course that's really what these vehicles are designed for you know running through wood lines or you know going through an urban environment they'll be able to provide enough fire support to let the infantry do their job unlike what they require for leopard 2 tanks and such to engage long distance targets and heavy armor which really this is not designed to do the vehicle has a crew of three, driver, commander and gunner, and can carry up to around six to seven troops depending on the configuration of loadouts that they have on board. 
Soldiers enter and leave the vehicle through the rear ramp, notice ramp, not door, and rear hatches. Now, the ramp configuration is used on some other vehicles out there we know of. Uh, I must admit, I really enjoy the ramp design. I kind of wish that uh, Warriors had more the ramp design than the door design, but there are inherently some problems with both kind of designs. The vehicle is very, very good in terms of mobility. It's its number one key attribute. However, this vehicle does not go amphibious, which was surprising to me because I thought it could. Now, there are configurations that allow this vehicle to become amphibious if you were to upgrade it into that package. But overall, as a standard service package, it just doesn't need to be. Uh, for the most part, you know, these vehicles are going to be able to use the engineers to pull in a bridge, whatever it may be, and go over there very, very quickly. And not heavy bridges, for, the, for that matter. You know, they're not going to require heavy-duty bridges uh, used for the Leopard 2s. They can probably set up some smaller bridge setups. So, you know, it's not a big contender, I think, or game-changer for this vehicle that is not amphibious, but something to think about. The LAV 6.0 upgraded version of the LAV 3 pretty much was put in place since uh, 2015 and 2017 for final completion. And luckily enough, it is fully finished now, and that is awesome. But I think the most important and founding principle of this vehicle is its mobility. The fact that it can lose actually four road wheel stations and still operate baffles me. Uh, the 8x8 configuration clearly is a game changer when it comes to mobility across very rough terrains or just operating along roads. Uh, firepower wise, yes, of course it is able to defend itself and even potentially take the attack to the enemy pretty good but for the most part i think we're looking at just something that can support infantry which is all it was really purposed for it doesn't need to be in prolonged engagements it would be nice to see maybe a bigger gun put on there you know maybe a 40 millimeter both a bigger turret but the more weight you add to this vehicle the less you do in terms of its mobility uh, take away from it so my personal opinion on this vehicle, and it's not just because I'm, you know, Canadian biased, it is very, very capable. We know of the Piranha system, we know of the Striker system, they also do very, very well. Uh, but it's nice to see Canada is actually making their own vehicles in-house, which to me is a great positive too, making Canadian jobs for those who uh, want to be a part of the military defence sector. And it just creates a bit of Canadian pride, you know, when we export these things, they're obviously doing a very good job in the markets, and they're selling well, so that's a fantastic selling feature uh, and something that makes me very proud to have in my own country. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video. I would really, really like it if you could uh, leave me a like and a comment, and I'd really appreciate if you could go check out my Patreon account for any donations of support you wish to make towards my channel. Being that I am mostly a military channel, YouTube doesn't support us very well as content creators, and it kind of sucks. But uh, I know many of you have been supporting me on Patreon uh, recently, so thank you very much personally to every single one of you. I cannot thank you enough. It means so much to me. It'll all go back into my channel, folks, so uh, just something to think about. Anyway, guys, I uh, hope you have a wonderful day, and I hope you enjoyed the video. All the best. Bye-bye.